Welcome to Fractures 101. This is going to be a basic review of uh, how we go about naming fractures and uh, try to make you sound a little more intelligent than you already are, of course. So this is uh, AJ Monzo, one of your attendings, and um, let's get started. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about. The location of the fracture, obviously that's important. The fracture line. Uh, displacement with regards to the fracture, and I like to remind you to uh, remember the arts with that. Uh, Peds fractures, uh, we'll go over the Salter Harris classifications as well as some types of fractures that are specific to pediatrics. And then uh, we are just going to throw up on the screen at the end uh, some eponyms just to get you exposed to some names that you may see down the road, especially on things like, oh, I don't know, board exams. So the location of the fracture is important. Despite what you might have been told, the bones of the lower leg are not the fibula and tibula. Just take a second. Let's let it sink in. I know it might be new. I hate to see it. I hate to hear it. Nobody really likes it, obviously. We don't want to sound like the guy who just rolled out of Hollywood Upstairs Medical College. So, um, know the name of the bone. If you have to look it up, look it up. It's not a problem. Just look it up. Don't let one of us see you looking it up, of course, because that might be embarrassing, but whatever. Um, you know, proximal, distal, mid-shaft, those are some easy names to remember uh, that make you sound at least a little more intelligent like you actually look through the x-ray. Um, proximity to anatomic structures is important. There's lots of descriptors of that, and they're typically specific to each bone. Um, things like intertrochanteric. Radial head, base of the fifth, um, tibial plateau, as well as things like Taylor dome, supracondylar, on a styloid, transverse process, femoral neck, intraarticular. Obviously, it's just a partial list. Now we're going to talk about the fracture lines. So, transverse, we've all seen, right? So that's a transverse fracture. Oblique. So let's all picture that in our minds, right? We're going to go at a bit of an angle, so there's an oblique fracture. Spiral fracture. And obviously a twisting type mechanism for that. Comminuted fracture. These are the ones that always make us cringe, right? Uh, impacted fracture. And avulsion fracture and a stress fracture. Stress fracture, we may not see a whole lot in the emergency department, but it can be helpful to think of this when you uh, see a patient who's had some chronic pain, and you may be the one who picks up on that uh, kind of callus formation without a definite fracture line would indicate a stress fracture, especially when they're tender right at that spot. So we're going to remember the arts. So angulation, rotation, translation, and shortening. Say it with me. Angulation, rotation, translation, shortening. Very good. So angulation. We all remember our protractor. Of course, math is fun, just as our little uh, thing says there. Um, first, we have to remember the anatomic position. The anatomic position. Oh, yes, that's right. It's the guy standing awkwardly in his underwear with his hands out to the side. Um, it's determined by AP and lateral films, and those must be at 90 degrees to each other. The easiest way for me to remember angulation is that is the direction that the bones are pointing. I know this can be confusing at times, but if you think of the, bone, the fracture as an arrow, it would be the way that the arrow is pointing. So, descriptors are going to be medial and lateral, anterior, posterior, volar, dorsal, on or radial. There are others. And we're going to put this up here. So now, I'm going to know which one is which. So the one on the left, would that be medial or lateral angulation? And then obviously the one on the right is going to be the opposite. So if we look at the one on the left, if it were an arrow, it would be pointing towards the... Very good. The medial portion of the body. So that's a medially angulated fracture, as opposed to the opposite on the other side, a laterally angulated fracture. So rotation 
can be difficult to see on an x-ray. It's typically found on exam and it's the direction that the distal portion has rotated. So uh, internally or externally, uh, which direction do you think this fracture has rotated? Yes. Correct. That is an externally rotated fracture. So translation is the direction that the distal fragment has slid. That be anterior, posterior, medial or lateral, volar or dorsal, on or radial, there are others. Um, in this one, this would be a laterally translated fracture or lateral translation. Um, you should also, when you're describing translation, describe the apposition. The apposition refers to um, how the two ends of bone are connected or not connected to each other. So end-to-end -end apposition is a non-displaced fracture, and that is end-to-end um, -end is 100% is another term for that. 50% being it slid 50% off to the side. Side-to-side -side is bayonet, and then no apposition is another descriptor, obviously, for fractures that are significantly uh, apart from each other. So this would be side-to-side -side apposition, or bayonet. So shortening is most obvious with side-to-side -side apposition, but it's also measurable with some impacted fractures, as you can see on the left. You can actually take that and measure uh, how far it's shortened. Peds fractures. Salter Harris fracture classification will be on all of your board exams from here on out, so let's get used to it. Uh, we also have some Peds fractures that are specific only to pediatrics, due to the flexibility of the cortex. So first, let's look at the uh, diagram there, which shows you the different parts of the bone. And the important part in the pediatric bone is the physis, as you can see at the bottom there. There's also a couple of other physes that are located toward the proximal portion of that femur that are signified by those dotted lines that seem to be shaded just a hint of blue. Um, the diaphysis is the largest part of the bone. That's the middle part. The epiphysis is on the outside of the physis, so that's that bottom portion. And the metaphysis is uh, between the physis and the diaphysis. Another picture of that. So we have our Salter-Harris classifications. Here's the way I like to remember them. It's a bit of a mnemonic. Um, straight through the physis would be a Salter Harris 1. That's about 5% of Salter Harris fractures. It can be extremely difficult to see on x ray um, if you see it at all. Type 2 is above the fracture line. Now, for this nomenclature, you have to picture the bone in this way. So, even if this were, say, the proximal humerus, you would have to envision the bone in this direction, so you'd have to effectively be flipping the person on their head when you're envisioning which way the Salter Harris goes. Speaking strictly, a, a um, Salter Harris 2 extends through the physis and into the metaphysis. Uh, that's above. Now below, or Salter Harris 3, extends through the physis and into the epiphysis. Um, as we saw there with type 2, that's the majority of Salter Harris fractures, 75%. Now type 3 is about 10%. As we get further in our classification, the um, fracture patterns become more um, dangerous. They have uh, more bad outcomes as you go further down the list here. Now, a Salter Harris 4 goes through each. That's how I remember through each, so T-E. And uh, that goes from metaphysis through physis into epiphysis. Now, it does not have to go in a straight line like this. It could go in a bit of a uh, an angled line, you know, so where it goes through the metaphysis, travels a little ways in the physis before it comes out on the epiphysis on maybe the other side of the bone. That's still a Salter Harris 4. Um, and then, fortunately, a very uncommon type of fracture, but that's a crush fracture of the physis, and that's a Salter Harris 5. Uh, there are other nomenclature systems that are proposed. In fact, the uh, Salter-Harris uh, classifications have been expanded um, to include um, more detail, uh, but this is the typical nomenclature that we would use in the emergency department. Finally, we have some PED-specific fractures. So a torus or a buckle fracture is a compression side fracture, while a green stick 
is a tension side fracture. So it's the first of the torus fracture, which is the picture on the top. Um, now, on the top, on the right side there, where you see the lateral film, you can see how the one side of the cortex is uh, appropriate in line, uh, while the other side of the cortex has a buckle in it. Now, if you can imagine what's happened there is the bone took a load and bent it toward the buckled portion of the cortex and causing that to give way. That's the compression side of the fracture. Now, if you imagine the same injury pattern, only instead of the compression side giving way, the tension side gives away, so the, the opposite portion of the bone, now you have a green stick fracture. So now the on the compression side, the cortex has held strong, but on the tension side, the cortex has fractured. Finally, um, is a plastic deformity, a plastic fracture. Most would not consider it a fracture because you don't really see a fractured line. Um, so most would consider that a plastic deformity. And as you can see there on the radius in that arm, uh, the bone is bent, and that is a plastic deformity. So here's some names. Look at them, soak them in. Maybe you want to sleep on this slide for a little while. Eponyms are a part of orthopedics. I'm sorry, but eponyms are a part of orthopedics. Um, when you're describing a fracture and you go into great detail and your orthopedist says back to you, oh, that's a galeazzi, you could have gotten the same amount of information across to your consultant by saying galeazzi as opposed to a nice long description. So um, you'll be exposed to these, uh, but it's not a bad idea to try to sit down and learn some of them at some point. Uh, we will talk about them in one of our later lectures. So, finally, to recap, let's talk about what we've talked about. So, in our brief overview of uh, basic fracture naming or nomenclature, we talked about knowing what the name of the bone was, not the tibula and fibula, of course. I know the location of the fracture. Also know other descriptors such as uh, intertrochanteric or... Uh, subcapital or etc. We want to know fracture lines, so transverse, we want to know spiral and all the other fracture line names. We want to remember the arts. So arts are angulation, rotation, translation, and shortening. And then finally we want to talk about Pete's fractures and those are Salter Harris fractures, buckle fractures, green stick fractures, and plastic deformities. Thank you very much for your attention, and we will have a series of slides together in a practice um, lecture where you can actually follow along and practice what you've just learned.